Greetings YouTubers, welcome to part four in the series on backpacking stove efficiency. Now I always recommend you watch them in order because each video builds on concepts introduced previously. In this case, you should specifically see part one with its discussion on the effects of pot diameter and flame level on fuel efficiency. And that background will be particularly useful here because this video is on the much requested HX pots or heat exchanger systems and they can vary in diameter quite a bit. Heat exchangers are just devices that are designed to transfer heat from one fluid to another without mixing them. In our case, that would be heat from your stove's flame into the water in your pot. The nearest example on Wikipedia would be this plate fin heat exchanger. You see the characteristic ripple construction of the heat transfer fin. Those same rippled fins can be found on the bottom of your typical HX pot. The idea is that all those ripples create lots of extra surface area through which to capture the heat in question, making them more efficient at transfer than a smooth surface, while still remaining relatively compact. So when you're trying to boil water in the backcountry, your stove inevitably wastes a substantial amount of its energy to the environment. The goal with these pots is to try and capture more of that lost heat and successfully transfer it into your water. With the theory being that greater transfer will increase efficiency and let you burn less fuel to get the same job done. So this video then is my attempt to investigate just what performance gains are actually achieved by a variety of different heat exchanger systems. Now you notice that I said heat exchanger systems instead of just pots. And that's because the integrated and proprietary design of some of these products makes it so you can only use their pot with their burner. Some pots could allow the use of multiple stoves, but for all my tests, a given heat exchanger is paired with a particular burner to create a simple system. So a few quick notes. I'm not sponsored by or affiliated with anybody for anything in any way. I buy all my own gear at full price. There's no free stuff for review, no deals or discounts whatsoever. My testing methodology is described in part one, but as a reminder, by boil I mean heated to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's more than enough to disinfect water and all you need for a hot drink or to rehydrate freeze-dried meals. And see part one of the backcountry water treatment series for details. For volume, I use 415 milliliters of water and that will comfortably fit in a half liter pot and it's enough to prepare pretty much any backpacking meal available. I use a precision scale and thermometer which help me achieve a margin of error of just 0.04 grams on the boil tests, which is fine enough to detect even very subtle differences in performance. All right, and without further ado, let me introduce you to this episode's players. Probably the most requested brand was Jetboil, and according to the specs on their website, the various models all get 12 boils to a small canister except the Flash, which only gets 10. So I chose two models. The stash is lightest overall and it comes with an unattached burner that could also be used with other types of pots and pans without needing an adapter. And I also picked up a Micromo. It's one of the lightest jet boils that use their flux ring burner and seems like it's essentially a regulated version of the zip. It also includes a separate adapter for use with regular vessels. The attachable burner has a shroud that looks like it will provide more wind resistance than the fairly exposed stash setup. Which reminds me, there is no wind testing in this video. All of the burns were conducted in still air inside my climate controlled shop which is kept between 48 and 50 degrees. Now, the purpose of this video is to establish a baseline for heat exchanger performance to see what adding fins to a pot really gets you and to isolate that effect from a complicating factor such as wind. Wind testing is coming, but that will be in another video after we see what fins can do first. I kept in mind though that wind is coming eventually when picking systems. When Flat Cat Gear makes windscreens, a couple of which were tested in part three using conventional containers. Well, they also make screens for HX pots and I got a cheetah. No, not that. One of these. There are versions that fit on a Pocket Rocket Deluxe or a Soda Windmaster, but I went with the one that uses a Fire Maple 300T stove, trying to build the lightest system possible. You just unscrew it, remove the pot arms, and replace them with the screen. After the modification, it weighs 55 grams. That's compared to a Pocket Rocket Deluxe at 80 grams and the Windmaster at 87. The Cheetos are also fitted to a particular pot. 
In this case, I chose the Wide C, which comes from Amazon and is set with a smaller bowl you can invert and use as a lid. For testing and system weights, I replaced that with this 130 millimeter universal titanium lid. It's the same one I used for the Tox bowl from parts one through three. But John at Flatcat doesn't just deal with his own designs. He also tinkers with products you can get elsewhere. And he found an interesting combination using the Fire Maples Petrol. The heat exchanger bottom of the pot has these cutouts for use with their included stove. But John, however, realized that a Soto Windmaster with the optional Triflex pot support fits those cutouts as well. And because of its flatter nature, the Triflex seats the burner head right up into the exchanger fins for what should be much better wind protection. And another option I thought might be interesting is the Fire Maple XT1. At 0.8 liters, it was the smallest heat exchanger kettle that I could find and I paired it with the BRS3000T. The fin ring is large enough that the arms of the stove fit entirely inside, allowing the burner head to recess into the opening. And when it comes to heat exchangers in the backcountry, MSR is not to be forgotten. And I chose the reactor because, according to their own specs, it's more efficient than the wind burner. And while it is indeed a heat exchanger, it's one of a somewhat different sort. And all of the others discussed so far expose their fins directly to the flame, or at the very least rely on the convection of hot air from that flame. The reactor uses a radiant system. Combustion within the burner head causes it to heat up glowing red hot so that it literally shines heat up at the pot's collector fins like a light bulb. This design lets them build a highly encapsulated system which helps the reactor's famous wind performance. So we'll test it here first without wind to see how the radiant method compares in its effectiveness at exchanging heat. And now for something completely different. MSR makes this attachable fin array which wraps around the outside of an otherwise normal pot, transforming it into a version of a heat exchanger. It's only made to fit a certain size range of pots, and MSR says right on their site that compatibility is from 6.6 .6 inches up to 7.3. Those are bigger pots though, and I really wanted to keep the container volumes as close to one liter as possible. So the closest compromise I could find was this Stanko grease pot made from thin walled aluminum, making it only 66 grams despite its 1.2 liter capacity. And as you can see, it will attach, but the pot being too small means this extra length of fins results in some overlap. And that in turn causes problems with the fit, so some of the fins can't make good contact with the pot. And it will hurt effectiveness, but we're getting about two-thirds connections, so there still should be some benefit. It's not optimum, I know. I was still curious about how it would handle a smaller pot for solo hiker scenarios. Now for a stove, I paired this with a Pocket Rocket Deluxe. Keep it in the MSR family and looking ahead to some measure of wind resistance when that time comes. Okay, so those are the players. Seven different systems to test a variety of vessel diameters, burner styles, and exchanger designs. For testing, I used my standard methodology. Again, see part one for details, but as a quick reminder, I run each system through a boil test at each of three different standardized flame levels, low, medium, and high. Those levels are kept consistent by using a series of MSR's low-down remote stove adapters. I have three, and each one is set to its own level. So burners are attached to the adapter instead of directly on the canister, and the burner's valve is left all the way open, so the flow rate's actually controlled by the adapter's valve. That way, every stove is fed the exact same amount of fuel for each level every time. So here are the results for each system on low flame. First off, the two jet boils are tied for first place with only 4.24 grams of fuel used per boil. Though the kettle is only 0 0.04 grams behind, which is technically within my 0.04 margin of error, so I suppose you could argue it's actually a three-way tie. The Cheetah system with the wide C pot is running a very close second. Then there's a significant fuel use jump with the reactor, which was kind of a surprise. And what I expected going in was to see the reactor as the efficiency champ. The only challenge I thought was to see if its fuel savings could make up for all the extra weight. 
Well, part of the reason I would assume that might have something to do with marketing claims like this. Maximum efficiency. Patent pending radiant burner, heat exchanger, and internal pressure regulator produce best in class fuel sipping efficiency in all conditions. Well, that's not even true according to their own performance chart. With no wind, their unnamed competition used 10% less fuel, even though it took longer to boil. Boil time tests are typically run at full blast with the stove wide open. MSR does not appear to publish data for their performance at low and medium levels. Yes, I know. A massive benefit of the reactor's design is its resistance to wind. Wind testing is coming, but this video is just a look at how the heat exchanger itself works and how well those compare to conventional vessels. And as it turns out, the radiant exchange used by the reactor may not be the most efficient method on its own when there's no wind. The MSR heat exchanger on a Stanko pot was next, followed by the petrol over a Soto Windmaster in last place. From part one, we saw that wider vessels tend to be more fuel efficient. They catch more of the burner's flame splash so less heat is wasted. Well, the petrol was the narrowest heat exchanger tested. You might be inclined to make that an excuse for why it required the most amount of fuel to boil. I see two problems with that. First, the Micromo's almost exactly the same size as the petrol, but it had substantially better performance. Second, remember also from part one, the amount of difference that vessel diameter makes is flame level dependent. On low, little or no direct flame spills off the edges of even a narrow pot. So there wasn't much difference in vessel performance despite a wide range of sizes. So what I think you're looking at here is more a result of heat exchanger performance than pot size. Now it's just a personal interpretation. I point those out in every video just to be clear and the data is always there for you to decide. For comparison, here are the HX systems alongside three different sizes of conventional containers. The Tox 550 Ultralight Pot, the Tox D118 Bowl, and the Tox 1600 Pan. You can see, for example, that adding all of this bulk and weight to the Stanko was essentially no better than just using a plain pan. The exchanger fins are usually along the outermost rim, in this case out beyond even the regular edges of the pot itself. And on low, there's virtually no flame splash out far enough on this particularly wide setup to make the exchanger worth it. The implication seems to be that the exchanger's performance will improve as we turn the flame up. Let's run everybody through on medium and see what happens. As we've seen in previous episodes, a lower flame is generally more efficient than a higher one, so turning it up does tend to increase the amount of fuel required to boil. It's not really news at this point. What is interesting is to see how the rankings change. The petrol, for instance, went from last place on low to eighth place on medium, pulling ahead of both the bowl and the pot. They're about the same size, but as you turn up the flame on a regular pot, all that spills off the edges is lost. With the petrol, however, these exchanger fins start catching that extra heat and conducting some of it back into the pot where it can successfully make its way into your water. And also note how the two jet boils went from being tied to the stash pulling ahead of the micromole. The diameter begins to make more of a difference on medium and the stash is noticeably wider. Now the trade-off for a medium flame is, of course, fuel for time. Consider the reactor. For just three-tenths of a gram of fuel, you can cut the boil time almost in half by going from low to medium. The next three-tenths of a gram, when going all the way up to high, only buys you 19 seconds. So, if you value time more than fuel efficiency, but don't want to waste too much for too little, then the sweet spot for compromise seems to be the proverbial happy medium. For the kettle, the pattern was very similar as it was for the other fin style exchangers. And speaking of a high flame, here are those results. All of the heat exchanger systems are now more efficient than any of the conventional pots, regardless of diameter. And the petrol actually catches and passes the Stanko system, which again, isn't being used to its greatest advantage here. And I do have plans to run tests on bigger pots to see how those perform for larger volumes of water. When I do, I'll put the MSR heat exchanger on a more appropriate diameter and see what kind of benefits it can provide when used properly. Now, in one respect, these results are somewhat familiar. Low seems to be the way to go for maximum efficiency. Medium and high save time, but waste fuel. 
But there's a significant difference between how HX and conventional pots react to flame level that becomes more obvious when the data is shown another way. So for these comparisons, I'll do my best to match vessels of similar width. Here are the diameters of the HX pots shown with those of the regular ones used in part one. So all of the HX systems were tested with lids on. Of the standard vessels, I did lid on testing of the pot, bowl, and pan using a pocket rocket dog. So, pairing only lid-on tests of the nearest size, I'll put the Petrol and Micro Mall with the Tox 550, the Cheetah, Reactor, and Stash with the D118 Bowl, and the Stanko and Kettle with the Pan. Now, the comparisons aren't perfect, but they don't have to be for what we're about to look at. So here's the reactor at low, medium, and high, next to just a regular bowl of about the same size. On low, there's about a quarter of a gram difference. The reactor saves you some fuel, but not much. On medium, the difference goes to about two thirds of a gram. But it's only on high that the reactor's heat exchanging talents really start to shine. Get it? Shine. It's a radiant system, so it shines. <laughs> if we put some trend lines in, you can see the difference in slope. Fuel use rises faster with flame level on a conventional pot. So put another way, the heat exchanger captures more of that extra heat as the flow rate increases, limiting the losses that hurt efficiency. So what you're seeing is the HX system actually doing its job. Now because the reactor is such a covered system, it's impossible to see what's going on inside when it's all put together. Even so, here are some action shots of the reactor on low, medium, and high. And you can get an idea of the difference by the amount of glow showing through the holes in the sides of the pot. And for the curious, here is the burner itself at all three different flame levels. For the high flame, I show it from ignition so you can see the actual bloom in progress. Fin style conductors also show a similar comparison to regular pots. The kettle's performance was amazingly flat across all three flame levels, with the difference between medium and high being a barely detectable 0.05 grams of fuel. And here are action shots of the kettle on low, medium, and high. The HX advantage, if you will, with the kettle was even greater than that seen with the reactor. 
And this isn't just because it's wider. The Petrol was the narrowest HX pot tested, almost exactly the same size as the tiny Tox 550. Yet it's got the greatest exchanger advantage so far, at least on high. The Petrol was the only system to post a higher fuel consumption than its conventional counterpart when the flame was set to low. And I'm not entirely sure why that is, but it may have something to do with a very close fit of the burner. If we look again at all the systems on low, they're arranged in order of their performance. And after measuring the size of the pot burner gap, I put those distances in the same order as low flame performance. Certainly, correlation is not causation, but there does seem to be a pattern here. As the gap between the burner head and the bottom of the pot shrinks, fuel efficiency suffers. The closest fit requires the most fuel to boil, while the two largest gaps enjoy the highest efficiency. The Kettle and the Cheetah had nearly the same performance and are maybe only a single millimeter different in their gap. I did my best with the measurements, which had to be eyeballed from an angle in some cases. So here's the petrol in action on low, medium, and high. The Cheetah system with the wide CHX pot is also looking pretty flat compared to a regular bowl of similar size. So this is what the Cheetah looks like in use. For the Stanco grease pot wrapped in the MSR heat exchanger, it's a different story. Comparing it to a pan, which does have about a 9mm size advantage, there is, within the margin of error, basically no difference. So that got me curious to see how the Stanco pot would do on its own without the exchanger attached. And here are those results side by side with the HX data. At both low and medium, there's effectively no difference. And that 0 0.02 gram increase for the exchanger on medium is with in the margin of error, so you should technically treat it as no change from the plain pot. Just to be eggheaded about it though, I would point out that heat exchangers can be used for both heating and cooling. This wrap design that goes up the sides of the pot creates the opportunity for a countervailing effect. If the water inside the pot gets hotter than these ripples, then they could end up acting like cooling fins more than heating exchangers. This probably can't happen at the bottom, but it might at the top depending on flame level, water level, your burner size, and how cold the air is outside. I'm not saying it's necessarily happening here, it's just food for thought. In any event, high was the only level where there was a detectable improvement with the MSR exchanger over a plain pot. And it was only a tenth of a gram of fuel per boil. And that's just enough to squeeze out one extra full boil from a small canister but you aren't likely to be in the woods long enough to make up for the weight of this thing. You'd save more fuel by ditching the exchanger and just lowering the flame. Now remember though, the pot I used is technically too small. The overlap in the wrap causes a loss in contact around parts of the circumference. I would have thought it could still do better than it did, but all you can really conclude is that this exchanger doesn't help a lot when used incorrectly. I have to put it on the list for someday, but I'd like to do more comprehensive testing using appropriately sized pots, larger volumes of water for longer boils, and maybe wider burners as well. All that I'll say is that it does not appear to be a practical option for the small jobs of one or two hikers.
The Micromo ended up posting the largest high flame improvement over a regular pot of any system tested. Because it's so narrow, its comparison is the tiny Tox 550, which suffers the most loss from turning up the flame. And that leaves the stash. It had the second highest improvement on high, but because of its size, the comparison was the bull, which fares better under a stronger flame. The real news, though, is its performance relative to itself on low, medium, and high. So based on all the testing so far, it's become axiomatic that an increased flame will speed things up, but at the cost of some fuel efficiency. You can put heat into the water faster, but you end up wasting heat even faster still. But what if your system is designed to catch that spillover heat? If it's effective enough, this could actually allow you to turn up the flame and save fuel. These results for the stash suggest that it is indeed possible. As a skeptic, my first reaction was to doubt these numbers. So I ran those boils again. And throughout the series, I've been learning and paying attention to the issues regarding accuracy and testing. For instance, previously the issue of canister pressure drop has been identified. As you run subsequent boils, expelling of gas chills the canister, and as the canister cools, its pressure can drop. That lower pressure can affect flame levels, which in turn can affect performance results. So what I do now is monitor the canister temperature with an infrared thermometer. And as the temperature starts to drop, I just heat it back up with my hands. And something else I've been paying attention to is residual heat in the test equipment. In the past, we were talking about a thin-walled titanium cup and a tiny stove. A splash of water in the cup can instantly chill it back to ambient, and the stove itself is cool to the touch in a minute. But with these larger, thicker pots and all this metal along the bottom, the issue of residual heat could become an issue. This might be especially true with some of the larger burners that have quite a bit of mass and stay hot for a while after shutting down. So I ran these tests by making sure each system was used only once per day. I put everybody through on low, then came back in 24 hours. Everything from the canister to the burner to the pot had ample time to reset temperature before beginning another round of tests. That way I'm never in the position of setting a fresh pot of water on a burner that had already been warmed up. This slows things down quite a bit, but we're chasing hundreds of a gram of fuel, right? So I'm trying to do my best. It might be paying off. I re-ran the stash on medium and got exactly the same result. 4.17 grams per boil. Then I waited a day and re-ran the low test. And this time I got 4.22 grams, two hundredths of a gram difference. That's half the 0.04 I've been using as my working margin of error. Either way, that means the reduction from low to medium is potentially real, and it continued to test below when run on high. So I've been trying, and I can't think of a reason why this should be impossible. Maybe you can. Consider the following thought experiment. You have a magical HX pot that captures 100% combustion heat from your burner. It wouldn't matter if you used low or high, because all the heat is being used either way. So fuel use should be exactly the same regardless, right? Actually, not really. While you're heating the water, there's an ongoing countervailing effect. Every second you pump heat into the pot, it's leaking out in every direction. And this creates an inherent advantage for speed. The faster you can heat up, the less time you endure the constant losses that thermodynamics demand. And with a low enough flame, you're never going to get anything more than tepid water especially when it's really cold outside. And that's regardless of how well your exchanger works. So theoretically speaking, if you can grab enough of the heat being produced, you could capitalize on the speed advantage to break even, maybe even benefit from, a higher flame. The stash might be the first stove to break the speed efficiency barrier. I still feel reluctant to say that you can actually save fuel by turning it up, 
Rather, I'd put it this way. There appears to be no measurable fuel efficiency penalty for faster flames, at least in the range of conditions tested and most importantly, without wind. The stash's exposed burner may cause it to switch places with some of its competitors once the air starts moving. Well, that's a subject for a different video. One way to compare the effectiveness of various exchangers is to look at the difference in fuel use between low and high flames. You've got the stash with its negative value, meaning you potentially save a very tiny amount of fuel by going from low to high. Then you have the kettle, the petrol, and the micromo all effectively tied with about a third of a gram penalty for using high. Next is the cheetah system, followed by the reactor with the Stanko trailing. For perspective, look at how that compares to a conventional pan, bowl, and pot. All of the exchanger systems save the heat from a high flame better than a plain container. It's interesting to note that going from a pot to a pan makes nearly twice the difference as going from the worst exchanger to the best. Though, another way to look at it is by comparing vessels of similar diameter. Going from a bowl to an HX bowl is about one and three quarters grams difference while going from a pot to an HX pot is almost two and a half grams. In terms of what factors affect performance, we know from part one that vessel diameter plays a role. And we saw here that there's a strong correlation between burner gap and fuel efficiency. But what about the construction of the exchanger itself? Now, if we look at the two jet boils, which were the performance leaders, they have something in common with each other that sets them apart from the other design. The micromo with its outer riser leaves not just the sides of the fins exposed to the heat, but the entire bottom as well. And while the stash does have a cover that wraps the corner slightly, it still leaves most of the fin bottoms exposed like the micromo. Well, you're free to argue about whether that should or should not make a difference. I'm just noting that it is one of the only conspicuous differences between the leaders and the rest. And then you look at the petrol, which had the lowest efficiency of any of the classic fin style exchangers, and you can see the bottoms completely covered. The petrol and the micromo are almost exactly the same diameter, but they're at opposite ends of the performance spectrum. And it might be easy to assume that the operative difference is the fin exposure. But remember that the petrol and the micromo are also at opposite ends of the burner gap. So which is it, the fin exposure or the burner gap? We'll never get drawn into a false dichotomy. It could certainly be that both factors affect performance, but one might be more controlling than the other. And usually when faced with such conundrums, more data helps. Consider the kettle, which performance-wise was almost indistinguishable from the micromole on both low and high. The petrol has covered bottoms, but a flat inner edge, leaving the entirety of the thin sides exposed. Well, the kettle has not only the bottoms, but part of the sides covered too yet it performs significantly better. And then again, it's also much wider. And the white sea pot, which is part of the cheetah system, has fins whose sides are almost half covered by a wraparound. And it's between the sizes of the kettle and the micro mold, but performed about as well as the kettle. And what the white sea shares with the kettle is an almost identical burner gap. Where is all this headed? First, let me enter freelance speculation mode. We saw from part one that pot diameter can affect fuel efficiency. On low, it didn't make much difference at all, but when the flame was high, you can really see it. Well, the HX pots tested had an even wider range of sizes than the vessels from part one. And despite that, their performance was ordered more according to the burner gap than their diameter. Pots with different diameters showed similar performance when they had the same burner gap. This is all based on correlations, but to me, it looks like the burner gap is actually more controlling than the vessel diameter. 
though the data does suggest that enough extra width can make up for some loss in burner gap. And the worst appears to be when you lack both size and distance. Now it plays by its own rules, but I feel like I owe you a bottom close-up of the reactor pot. It has a radial array of fins that are both longer and thicker than the other HX pots. And all this metal contributes to the reactor being one of the heavier vessels tested. And that is my segue into the last big topic to discuss, weight efficiency versus fuel efficiency. First, the component weights starting with the HX pots themselves. I've included their rated capacities at the bottom, having done my best to find a collection of some of the smallest, lightest options available. The stash pot came in as the lightest, even though it's not the smallest volume. Thin walls and a squarish aspect ratio make it an efficient design. The petrol was close behind at only 7 grams more, and the wide sea, remember, is the pot used with the cheetah system. The kettle was the heaviest of the fin style exchangers. Its width gives it more size, but also circumference, meaning more exchanger fins, and also more weight. The Stanko pot itself is a very thin-walled aluminum that weighs only 66 grams, which is great for a 1.2 liter vessel, but on this chart the weight of the fins is included, so I added the 167 grams of the MSR heat exchanger. And this is how those weights compare to the conventional titanium containers used in part one. You could carry three Tox 550s for less than the weight of even the lightest HX pot. And here are the lid weights, shown separately so you can make adjustments if you use a custom option. I used the manufacturer's lids in each case except the wide C, which didn't include one, so I brought in a titanium lid from the bowl in part one. And the last component of each system is the burner. And as a reminder, I used the BRS with the kettle. The wide C was paired with a Fire Maple 300T modified with a flat cat gear cheetah windscreen. The petrol ran with a Soto Windmaster outfitted with the optional Triflex, while I put a Pocket Rocket Deluxe under the Stanko setup. And the Stash, Micro, Mo, and Reactor all came with manufacturer stoves. And the reactor's massive radiant burner weighs almost seven and a half times as much as a tiny BRS. When you put all the pieces together for a total weight, this is how it looks. The reactor system is getting close to being twice as heavy as a Stash. The petrol is your second lightest option, with the cheetah not that far behind. The kettle, despite being one of the heaviest vessels, ends up coming in below average on system weight because of its tiny lid and the use of an ultralight stove. And all the weight of its integrated burner cradle makes the Micromo the second heaviest arrangement. So just for perspective, here is how the HX systems compare in weight to a simple BRS and Tox 550. So before we get into the weight efficiency calculations, I will acknowledge it again so you don't think I forgot. Yes, this is all without wind. I do feel it's important to get a fundamental understanding to establish a baseline for comparison before moving on. And if it happens to be a calm day or you're on a trail like the AT where there are shelters, you may not have to worry about it. Now, when calculating whether a system's fuel savings are worth its weight, it matters how much fuel you'll be carrying. And this will be based on the number of boils you plan on needing, which is in turn determined by the number of people in your group, the number of boils each person will need per day, and the number of days of your trip. So I do calculations based on solo hikers just because that's what I tend to be. And even when I'm with others, we all tend to have our own cook kits and fuel. But if you hike with a partner or share resources, you can just double the numbers. As far as the length of most trips go, I'm guessing a lot of people make do with a week or less. Even a 2,000 mile hike like the AT is really just a long series of shorter hikes between resupply points, which are frequently available. Most hikers will carry only three to six days of food at a time. And on the Pacific Crest Trail, that range is said to be around four to 10 days worth. And that's also why I base calculations on the life of a small canister. With an efficient system, you can get over 20 boils out of one of these. Now, I only do one boil per day, but even if you double that, a small canister can last 10 days or more. And given the opportunity for resupply, that's enough to get you across the entire country. So just for the record, a small can contains 110 grams of fuel. And its gross weight is 211 grams, which means the empty canister weighs 101 grams. And in case you ever wondered how to tell how much fuel is left while you're in the field, MSR prints this scale on the side. 
Just float the canister in water, and where the water line crosses the scale will give you an estimate of how much fuel remains inside. The medium can holds 227 grams of fuel, making it just 7 grams more than two smalls. The canister itself weighs 147 grams, making it 55 grams lighter than two empty smalls. So if you need this much fuel, you save weight by carrying one medium instead of two of these. The same holds true for a large canister. You get a little more fuel than four of these while only carrying 210 grams of can weight instead of 404 grams with all the little ones. So in the same way, a big is more weight efficient than two mediums. Okay, so that's why all my calculations are based on the life of a small canister. There's nothing sacred about that distinction though. Feel free to extrapolate out to whatever fits your specific scenario. So my standard for comparison was the Tox 550 with a lid and a BRS 3000T stove. It's just about the lightest, most compact system you can assemble. In still air with a lid on and low flame, you can get a boil with 5.56 grams of fuel. So for HX systems in the same conditions, the stash had the lowest fuel consumption at 4.24 grams. It also happens to be the lightest weight. So that's a fuel savings of 1.32 grams per boil. But stash system weighs 121 grams more than a BRS and a 550. So it will take 92 boils worth of savings to make up for the difference. Well, 92 boils worth of stash consumes 390 grams of fuel. And that much gas requires a large canister or four small ones. So one way to interpret that is to conclude that if you never need to go out with this much fuel, then a stash can't save you enough to be worth its weight. You have to be careful with that though. I suspect that most people don't go out thinking, I need 390 grams of fuel. If you're like me, the more likely metric is, I'll need 92 boils to cook all the food and heat all the drinks for everyone on this trip. So using 92 boils as the basis, what happens if you leave the stash home and take your ultralight kit instead? The BRS option requires 512 grams of fuel to do all that heating. And that's 62 grams more than a large canister, which means carrying one of these plus one of these. Well, a small canister adds 211 grams to your pack, more than the 121 grams you saved by not bringing the stash. This is true. You technically only need 62 grams more than a large canister holds, and a full small can has 110 grams. Okay. You can use a refill adapter to bleed off the extra 48 grams of fuel into an emptier can. You're still left with the extra 62 grams of fuel needed, plus the weight of that additional small can, for another 101 grams. And this weight surplus of 163 is still more than the 121 gram cost of a stash. So in this particular scenario where you have to have those 92 boils, it does end up being lighter to carry the heavier stash because that means you won't have to carry an even heavier extra can of gas. So what's the use case for 92 boils? Probably longer trips with larger groups that like their hot food. If you go out with four people, they get 23 boils each for the entire trip. If you like coffee and oatmeal in the morning, plus a pouch meal and a cocoa at night, that's four boils per day. Those 23 boils will keep you happy for a five day trip with a few extra boils just in case. Or you could stretch it to six days and have to give up the coco on your last night. And on the other end of the spectrum, the solo hiker that only needs one boil per day. And that's usually me. For people like that, 92 boils means 92 days. Well, the only reason I'm going to be in the wild for three months without resupply is if this happens. All kidding aside. If you are building an emergency bag, fuel efficiency might be more important to you than weight, up to a point. Different purposes can have different priorities. But getting back to the soloist who only boils once a day, let's be generous and say the ultralight cook kit will let you prepare 20 batches of hot water per small can. So unless you'll be out longer than 20 days without resupply, requiring you to bring more canisters, then a stash isn't going to be able to pay for its extra weight. So even if you use the 10 day upper limit for resupply on the PCT and do two boils per day, you can still get that done with just this and one of these. 
And the challenge just grows the heavier your HX system gets. A 1 liter reactor weighs 307 grams more than the BRS and the TOPS. On low with no wind, it saves you 0.51 grams of fuel per boil. And that means 602 boils to break even on the extra weight. Maybe if you're melting snow for your entire Mount Everest expedition, but that's a long way from practical for the more regular hiking scenarios. Again, this is all without wind to see what just the exchanger can do on its own. So the reactor is famous for being close to impervious to the wind, while the BRS is infamously susceptible. I fully expect the rankings to change once the air starts moving. While we're on the reactor, by the way, there was one more thing that occurred to me. As I'm doing the tests, I wait for the water temperature to reach exactly 200 degrees, and then I immediately start turning off the gas. It takes several turns to shut off completely, so it can take a few seconds. The flame is shrinking, but still on during that time, so there's always some amount of overheat. This doesn't affect the accuracy of the tests, of course, because my calculations are based on total amount of fuel used and total amount of temperature raised. It's just something I've noted along the way. It varies depending on the flame level used, but on medium, the overheat is usually in the range of 1 to 4 degrees. Well, I noticed that with the reactor, it was over 10 degrees. In fact, the temperature would actually keep rising even though the gas had been completely off. I could watch the water getting hotter and hotter for as many as 15 to 20 seconds after the flame was gone. And with these ultra-thin, ultra-light components, the water starts cooling off pretty much immediately after you cut the flame. But all of this extra mass holds a lot more heat, as it turns out enough to warm the water several degrees more. That heat after the gas stops is, in fact, credited in the efficiency scores, so you might wonder why the reactor didn't fare better. Well, from a cold start, you have to get all of this mass glowing red hot before your water boils. Any heat left over in your system after you pour off the water amounts to wasted fuel. And let me tell you, this thing is still finger burning hot long after one of these is already cooled to the touch. So that's an effect that hurts the reactor in particular since its burner assembly is the heaviest by far. But that is for single boils from a cold start. All that residual heat could become a benefit if you need to do multiple boils in a row. That second boil you see is going to benefit from the head start of an already hot burner. <sighs> Alright, back into the shop to heat some more water. I rehearsed a routine where I could dump the first batch of water the moment it hit 200 degrees and refill the pot with cold water and keep going as quickly as possible. On low, the reactor doesn't get to a full glow like it does on medium and high, and medium was more efficient than high. So I ran this test on medium to see how much that red hot burner helps a second boil. A total of 10.11 grams of fuel were used. Well, knowing that 5.67 grams are required for the first boil from a cold start leaves 4.44 grams for the second one. And that's 1.23 grams less fuel to make the second batch of water, over 20% less. A non-trivial difference. And bear in mind that these are raw fuel consumption numbers, the actual weight of gas used to push the thermometer straight through to 200. So in order to give credit for the overheat after the gas is shut off, all my charts use an amount of fuel normalized to exactly 200 degrees. If you could somehow anticipate the amount of overheat, you could theoretically shut the fuel off early and let the temperature coast into a perfect 200 before it starts cooling back down. So that would give you the numbers shown in all the charts. This method accounts for all the heat actually transferred even after shutoff and makes for the best direct comparison between systems for single boils from a cold start. The two boil reactor test can't make use of overheat in the same way so I'm showing you the raw fuel consumption numbers instead of the normalized ones. So just for perspective here again is the medium flame chart and this is what it looks like when done with the raw fuel consumption numbers. And you can see that everybody remains in the same basic order, just by somewhat varied amounts. Again, raw numbers are not the most accurate and precise way to do direct comparison, but they are a sort of necessary sloppiness in this specific case. And anyway, just so you can see it, this is what the raw version looks like when you add the reactor's second boil. It's not fair to put a second boil up against everybody else's first. This is really just a comparison of the reactor to itself. 
Still, at least for me, it gives some idea of what the benefits might be for a scenario in which you are doing multiple consecutive boils using a stove that's already paid that initial price to warm up. And all of these systems would benefit to some degree from consecutive boils, though the reactor with its weight and design is likely to benefit the most. And with that, I think it's finally time for the summary. In general, HX pots are more efficient than a regular pot of similar diameter at any given flame level, so the heat exchanger elements do provide a measurable benefit. The HX advantage grows as the flame level increases. Shown in red is the number of full boils you can get out of a small can for both a micro mo and a conventional Tox pot when used at low, medium, and high. So on low, you get seven extra boils. On medium, you get nine, and on high, you'll get 11 extra boils out of just one can. So the efficiency penalty for a high flame is large with a regular pot, but with the heat exchanger, that penalty can shrink to almost nothing. And the stash may have actually achieved unicorn status by showing no penalty at all. It changes the calculus for those who value time over peak fuel efficiency. While less effective exchanger systems will still be technically most efficient when used at low, some designs can go a long way towards removing most, if not all, of the penalty for speed. Weight is an issue, though. The lightest HX pot was still significantly more than even the heaviest of the conventional containers. This creates the dilemma of, of whether the fuel savings can be worth the weight. For total weight, even the lightest HX system was more than double a simple BRS and pot. So for trips that require only a small canister, the saved fuel won't make up for the heavier components. You need to be using this much fuel, the equivalent of four of these, before approaching the trade-off in grams. And that's really only practical for larger groups and longer expeditions. For just one or two hikers on an average resupply, it's lighter and more compact to skip the HX. The particulars of fin design itself do not appear to correlate with performance. We know from part one that diameter plays a role, but saw here that the gap between burner head and pot bottom matches the ranks for efficiency. The MSR's wraparound heat exchanger isn't really suited for smaller sized pots used in this analysis. An overlap interfered with fin to pot contact. I thought it still might be worth something, but there was only a tenth of a gram difference from the naked pot, even on high. And finally, the reactor with its radiant design was different from the other fin exchangers. It posted below average performance and was easily the heaviest system, making it unlikely to be a weight efficient option for individuals or couples with average resupply options available. Once you heat up all that mass though, the reactor does get significantly better with subsequent boils. And you can start to see why it's a choice for large expeditions that will be melting many batches of snow. And then of course the reactor is famous for being highly wind resistant. And that's something I'll have to test in a future video. Unfortunately, the season has already passed. My shop is too warm to do any more testing until the fall. Well, I hope that gives you at least a basic idea about heat exchangers. As always, I very much appreciate your time, and thanks for watching.